This is Bart Peterson, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Greg Gilchrist, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. This is Dan DeMarco, and you are listening to the FCPA Compliance Report on the Compliance Podcast Network. In today's episode, I'm joined by Morrison and Forrester partner, James Kukios. We take up the following cases, developments in Brazil around the car wash investigation, SEC amends rules governing whistleblowers, Sergeant Marine, FCPA enforcement action, a rare criminal case, and an old trader charged with bribing Ecuadorian officials, all on the FCPA compliance report. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode, and I'm always pleased to have have back with me James Kukios, partner in Morrison and Forrester, uh, to talk about the firm's always excellent uh, monthly international uh, anti-corruption development newsletters. Today, we're going to take up September. So, James, first of all, uh, welcome back. Thanks, Tom. Great to be here. James, uh, always interesting uh, developments each month, and uh, Brazil is often on your uh, top 10 list. But we had some uh, interesting developments out of Brazil, uh, even going back to car wash. What did uh, you guys see there? Well, it's interesting. You know, uh, Operation Car Wash, which is the massive investigation involving alleged corruption at Brazil's state-owned oil company, Petrobras, started way back in March of 2014. Um, and it's been going strong ever since. We're, we're at six years plus. Uh, it's ha- obviously had a huge impact in Brazil. Uh, many politicians, business people have gone to jail. Many of the biggest companies and service providers have have entered into um, various kinds of corporate resolutions. Um, just had a tremendous impact both in Brazil and outside of Brazil. I mean, we've seen resolutions involving the United States and Singapore and the Netherlands, and just just a massive impact. Probably we've described it before as the 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 largest and global anti-corruption case ever in the world. Um, that said, over the last year or so, we have reported that we've started to see some signs that it may be starting to slow down. Uh, among other things, there's been various pushback from various parts of the Brazilian government and the elite, who obviously for maybe are a little tired of it for perhaps obvious reasons. In September of 2020, there was a couple developments. Um, number one, there was a shakeup uh, at the head of the car wash investigation, the person who had been leading it um, for pretty much the entire time of car wash's existence, stepped down and a new person was uh, named in his place. Perhaps more importantly, uh, the attorney general extended Lava Jato until the end of January 2021. And there was indeed in September some additional activity showing that um, some search warrants of an oil services provider showing that there is still some life left in Lava Jato. But very interesting, the attorney general refused to um, grant a longer extension. Prosecutors had asked for it to be an extension of one year, but only six months was granted. And then interesting, and this is technically October, but it, but it happened while we were going to press with our September newsletter. Um, the president of Brazil said it was done. He said he, he ended it. And he had done so because there is, quote, no more corruption in the Brazilian government. So we have part of the uh, government saying it's going to last until at least until the end of January of next year. We have part of the government saying it's over now. Um, we have some indications that it's slowing down, other indications that it's still going. So long and story short is, uh, uh, as we are, our, our heading for this one was, uh, car wash to be extended? <laughs> well, question mark. So it, it looks like it has a little bit of life left, but it does seem like it may be coming to an end uh, in the relatively near future. Uh, James, next up, we had the SEC really led by Commissioner uh, Jay Clayton amending the rules governing whistleblower awards. We have touched on this in prior podcast when there was either discussions of this or uh, the rule was put out for commentary uh, and we've speculated really as to, to why they needed to be amended. I, for one, really didn't see the need for amend, the amendment. The, uh, the SEC, at least, thought there needed to be some uh, technical cleanup. 
but I was wondering if uh, we might be able to discuss why were they were amended, and then from your perspective, both inside, formerly inside the government, now of course uh, in private practice, um, how do you see the the SEC whistleblower program um, as uh, as it's um, continued to play out over the years? Sure. Well, maybe I'll start with the second part first, and I'll and I'll start with the uh, SEC's perspective. Um, the SEC certainly thinks that the whistleblower program has been successful. In announcing the amendments, uh, the SEC noted that since the implementation of its program in 2011, it had recovered over $2.5 billion in financial remedies as a result of original information provided by whistleblowers, and that it had awarded over $523 million to 97 individuals in 80 enforcement actions. So certainly from the SEC's perspective, overall, the whistleblower program has been very effective. And I do think that it's had a huge impact. You know, I used to run the uh, DOJ FCPA unit uh, email inbox where we would get a lot of whistleblower um, intake. And even though it's separate from the SEC, we did see the impact of the SEC's whistleblower program in that. You know, we used to just get a lot of, and, 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 and still did, but a lot of kind of random emails. Some of them were not very actionable because they were very um, uh, vague or didn't contain a lot of information. Um, once the whistleblower program came out, there developed an entire whistleblower bar, and that really caused an increase. And in, I'd say the quality of the submissions in, insofar as they were well-written, they had more information, they're much more detailed, and um, they had a contact um, that you, somebody you could actually call to, if you needed more information. Now, a lot of them were still not verified or didn't pan out, so I'm not going to say that it resulted in you know, always better information uh, substantively, but certainly in, in how it was presented, it was much, much easier uh, for, for us as enforcement attorneys to deal with. Um, And and so I think there has been a a big impact of the whistleblower program. That said, like everything else in life, there's always room for improvement. And according to the SEC, it made these amendments uh, based on what they called lessons learned from the last 10 years um, of experience administrating the program. That's good. You know, the uh, agencies always tell companies you should use lessons learned in your to revise your compliance program. So I guess they're using lessons learned to revise their whistleblower program. But the way that SEC phrased it is that they needed to provide, um, the amendments were needed to provide greater transparency, efficiency, and clarity to whistleblowers to ensure that whistleblowers are properly incentivized and to continue to properly award whistleblowers to the maximum extent appropriate and with maximum efficiency. Uh, I, I think that's probably all true from their perspective. Um, I just wanted to add that sort of behind the scenes in the background, I think there were two additional things that were going on that maybe reflect some of those, um, those items that SEC mentioned. Number one, um, there has been public criticism about these areas, particularly regarding the whistleblower awards taking too long to process. And so some of the amendments this time were to help SEC be able to kind of um, uh, get through what they see as more frivolous whistleblower allegations quickly so they can then get on to the more substantive ones and and make decisions. Uh, The second thing going on in the background is there have been some court decisions that affected parts of the program, probably most importantly, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in 2018 that limited the scope of the Dodd-Frank anti-retaliation protections. And uh, some of the amendments, this were uh, intended to address that as well. So Supreme Court said uh, the protection didn't go as far, and so the SEC had to amend their rules to react to that. And that really leads to the last point I wanted to raise with you, not specifically whistleblower-related, but we've had two... uh, Supreme Court decisions directly impacting the SEC over the past, I think, about three years. The first was Kokesh, and then the second one you mentioned, uh, the one you mentioned, rather, is the second case, Digital Realty Trust. Do you see any um, potential emphasis in uh, either the Biden administration or the incoming Congress to uh, basically overturn those Supreme Court decisions by uh, administrative or rather uh, a legislative change? 
There has been some talk about legislative fixes for both Kokesh and digital realty. I think um, the Kokesh fixes were actually discussed in Congress, but nothing happened. Um, digital realty seemed a little bit farther away. Um, so uh, there is the, there does seem to be some appetite to discuss legislative fixes. They haven't gone very far yet. Um, we'll, of course, like everything, have to wait and see if um, we have divided government or not after the election here. Um, there may be some interest, perhaps, on the Democratic side to fix these and maybe less interest on the Republican side to do so. But um, they haven't – it doesn't seem like they've got a lot of impetus thus far in terms of the legislative fixes. And instead, it may be just left to the SEC to try to figure out either through practice or through administrative rules how they're going to deal with these rulings. Um, James, next up is a case, frankly, I've been looking forward to visiting with you about. It's one of the most delicious FCPA cases I've seen in quite a while. It's the Sergeant Marine case. It was an extraordinarily rare criminal prosecution against the company, but there were also uh, either five indictments or guilty pleas from individuals involved. And so I was wondering maybe if I could just uh, get you to, to give a little bit of the background and, and what made for such an unusual enforcement action. Sure. It's, it's interesting you use the word delicious because the product involved was asphalt which I don't think most people would consider to be very delicious. But um, this is basically um, a case involving Sergeant Marine, which is a Florida-based uh, marine uh, 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 oil services company. They provide asphalt to uh, various, in this case, um, South American state-owned oil companies, Petrobras, Petroecuador, and Petavesa. And the allegations were they used various middlemen and schemes and whatnot to pay bribes to officials at those oil companies to buy their product. Um, it was, uh, there was a lot going on in that case. It, there was a guilty plea, not unheard of for a company, but there was a guilty plea for the company. Uh, and then there are a number of um, individuals who are charged and, um, and, and pled guilty that had been previously unannounced. DOJ essentially waited until they reached um, agreement with the company, and then they announced the individual guilty pleas by three company employees and traders, an agent and a consultant in Brazil and Venezuela, as well as a former Venezuelan government official who was an alleged bribe recipient. Um, and then the, all of those folks had pled guilty, and then there was the unsealing of a criminal complaint against yet another um, former Venezuelan official as, as well. So very... Um, uh, kind of big announcement at, at the time, uh, company plus all these individual uh, cases. And uh, really, I mean, when you look at DOJ policy, when they say we don't want to just go after companies, we want to go after individuals. This is sort of like the paradigm case. You know, we announce, uh, is it five or six guilty pleas, charges against another person, plus a guilty plea of the company. So it was pretty, pretty um, kind of a, the perfect example of what DOJ tries to do in terms of corporate and individual um, uh, prosecutions. Little interesting that there is a, a a company guilty plea in this case. You know, one of the factors that DOJ is supposed to consider when they're deciding how to resolve a corporate case uh, is whether um, there is uh, an ability to bring charges against individuals. And presumably, I mean, the thought is if you can bring cases against individuals, there's less of a, a reason to bring a case against the company. Um, or perhaps sometimes it manifests itself as a deferred prosecution or a non-prosecution agreement against the company when it's accompanied by uh, uh, individual prosecutions, especially where it seems like the company cooperated in those as well. And there are some pretty high-level prosecutions here. In fact, one of the defendants was a, a, had the same name as the company, um, Daniel Sargent. Um, so it's a little unclear to me why in this particular case there was – a requirement that the company actually plead guilty instead of enter into a deferred prosecution agreement or something like that. Um, my speculation here from reading the charges is that it went pretty high up in the company and it involved pretty senior level officials. And those are two circumstances where you, the principles of federal prosecution of business organizations would, would tend to kind of weigh in favor of a more severe penalty in that regard. Um, one other interesting thing about this 
resolution, and I think you wanted to talk about it, Tom, was the uh, inability to pay analysis. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So um, back in, uh, when was it? I believe it was uh, 2018, uh, DOJ, sorry, it was October 2019, uh, DOJ Criminal Division released a formal policy uh, to guide prosecutors on how to uh, approach inability to pay claims. Uh, those that happened in the past in some FCPA resolutions, uh, not often, but sometimes the Odebrecht um, resolution, for example, the Nordam resolution. Um, and, you know, I think DOJ did a pretty good job with that, but the criminal division felt like it needed to be more structured. So in October 2019, they put out guidelines on that. I believe this is the first case to apply those guidelines in the FCPA context since those were released. And um, essentially what happened here is uh, the company and DOJ agreed that the proper the guidelines analysis penalty plus a discount for cooperation would be $90 million. But then the company told DOJ that they couldn't pay that much. And so they followed the inability to pay guidance, uh, went through the process, examined the company's finances, um, looked at what impact this would have on its ability to continue to exist as a company, um, and decided that the proper fine was only $16.6 million. So you had almost a $73, $74 million discount in the, in the penalty because of an inability to pay. Not only was it reduced, but there was also an installment plan. So uh, Sergeant Marine only had to pay part of that immediately, and then it was given eight months to pay the rest. Um, and so that we see kind of, I think, that I can recall, the first real application of that inability to pay guidance in an actual FCPA resolution. The um, inability to pay, to me, James, actually seemed to turn on the fact that they could no longer count on the revenue uh, that they had been receiving from the South American energy companies by paying bribes. And so I thought part of my deliciousness in this case was that the circular argument that because we can't pay bribes and we've now been criminally prosecuted for it, we can't pay you the fine and penalty. Uh, and I just thought that was an anomaly. But the other thing was it really drove home to me the message of the following. Years ago, I met a um, person who had been at Panel Pina back in the day and um, he stayed through the uh, enforcement action. Uh, and he said that Panel Pina could never uh, recover the revenues that they lost because they basically didn't know how to do business in uh, Africa ethically and in compliance uh, with the FCPA. And the Sergeant Marine case struck me as, as close to that uh, and a, a really powerful message that beyond the fines, beyond the penalty, beyond the reputational damage, and beyond the potential, um, you know, individual liability, you can literally put a company out of business uh, if you base your business strategy on bribery and corruption and you're caught. So I thought that was an, an interesting lesson. The other question I really had for you was, um, you detailed uh, the process DOJ went through, but the other thing that struck me in terms of the fine reduction was the court commented on the process the DOJ went through. And I, and I guess I was a little surprised because I had thought courts uh, almost rubber stamped uh, these um, agreements uh, that came before them uh, under the FCPA. And the court seemed to go out of its way to acknowledge and compliment the DOJ and the rigor of the financial analysis it went through. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, there's been a number of uh, appellate court decisions that do limit the ability of judges to set aside um, DPAs, for example. Um, but they do have to, when it's a guilty plea, and if it's a C plea in particular, they have to make sure, the judge has to make sure that they're comfortable with the uh, the analysis and the, the uh, agreed upon guideline range because they're bound by it. So it's, a, it's an interesting fact. Um, I do remember even before um, the, the formal guidance was released, um, I was involved in one of the inability to pay cases. And it was very, it was very rigorous. I mean, there, there were experts hired. Um, you know, we looked very closely at the company's finances. The 
the formal guidance really outlines how to do this in a very rigorous way. So I, I agree, it is a very um, rigorous process. You know, and, and some other important things, it's not just um, an argument that, hey, you know, if we have to pay this money, we may not be able to sell as much next year or we can't in, invest in this R&D or things like that. It's actually supposed to be existential questions. Uh, in other words, you know, if we if we pay you ninety million dollars, we will no longer exist as a company. Um, so I, I I now get your point about the deliciousness, um, but but that sort of is exactly what the um, inability to pay guidance is supposed to be. You know, uh, if you pay this money and you have no income, you will go out of business. James, we had uh, one uh, matter I just wanted to touch on uh, for some uh, kind of personal reasons, and that was. Uh, you cited a oil trader charged with bribing an Ecuadorian official. And the reason I found this uh, interesting from my perspective is over the past, I don't know, maybe five, even seven years, I had lots of discussions with energy companies in Houston about uh, traders getting in trouble. And they maintain that, tra- look, this is just oil trading. Uh, we're not paying, even if we're paying bribes, they're very low. And no, uh, it's just uh, nobody... Uh, this is not going to, the FCPA is not going to apply to this. And I argued that every time you have an interaction interaction with a national oil company official, that's a potential FCPA uh, interaction. And um, that argument generally fell on deaf ears. But here we have an oil trader at a Houston energy company, uh, at least charged with uh, bribing Ecuadorian officials to secure contracts. So I was really interested uh, because of the oil trader angle. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, this is another of the, of the many Petro Ecuador cases involving the state-owned oil company of Petro Ecuador. Um, according to this, the indictment, uh, this guy Aguilar, Javier Aguilar, was an oil trader at a U.S. subsidiary of a multinational oil distributor and trading company. Um, and DOJ alleged that he had used fake consulting agreements to pay. Uh, intermediaries via U.S. and offshore bank accounts um, that then found its way into the hands of Ecuadorian officials. So, I mean, you know, you read the indictment, it's very much like like all kinds of FCPA cases that involve third parties and, and a, a use of fake consulting agreements and things like that to get, um, to get business. So I think it's a good point, Tom. Uh, just because you're called a trader doesn't mean that there's no risk. Well, James, uh, I wanted to thank you again for taking the time to visit with me, and I look forward to visiting with you about the firm's October newsletter. Thanks, Tom. Pleasure being here. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. I'd like to thank you for listening to this episode of the FCPA Compliance Report. If you have any questions on this episode, you can email me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. I would greatly appreciate it if you would rate our podcast and iTunes as would help us increase our rankings and expanding our listener base for the oldest podcast in compliance. If you have any questions you'd like explored on this podcast, please send them to me as well, or you can leave them on the Compliance Podcast Network. The FCPA Compliance Report is a production of the Compliance Podcast Network. I hope you'll join us again next week where we take up another issue in FCPA and compliance. Thanks again for listening.